welcome to Inside America. Tuesday marked the third anniversary of the Middle East and North Africa popular uprisings, or the so-called Arab Spring, which all started with the self-immolation of a Tunisian street vendor against the harsh and humiliating treatment of his authoritarian government. It was remarkably unprecedented for average Arabs to be able to topple their longtime dictators from the streets. The ousting of Middle East dictators, who had long enjoyed Western support, made many argue for the emergence of strong, moderate and electoral Muslim forces on the one hand, and the weakness, if not entirely irrelevance, of radical groups such as Al-Qaeda on the other. It was at this time when Osama bin Laden was killed, and earlier in May, after nearly a dozen years since the September 11 terrorist attacks, President Obama sought to narrow the scope of the so-called war on terror. Today, the core of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan is on the path to defeat. But over the past few months, things seem to have been turning upside down. In Egypt and Tunisia, the first democratically elected Islamist leaders have been forced to resign. Elsewhere, radical Islamists seem to, seem to have been on the rise rather than on the path to defeat, as their militants have found new safe havens in Libya and Syria and continue to kill, kidnap and sow terror across much of Africa and the Middle East. The attacks launched by Al-Qaeda and its proxies have been powerful and indiscriminate. They have targeted shopping malls in Africa, government and rebel forces in Syria, and also broken into major prisons, setting their fellow fighters free in Afghanistan and Iraq. So as the Arab Spring hopes are fading, is radical Islamism resurgent? How does Obama treat these developments? Apart from the massive drone campaign, does the Obama administration have a coherent counter-terrorism policy? Well, joining me to discuss this subject is David Rene, uh, the Washington bureau chief of The Economist magazine. Also here in Washington, Ahmed Majidiar, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, a conservative foreign policy think tank, is joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. David, let me start off with you. Can we still use the term Arab Spring? Well, I think we have to use it with a, with a heavy heart. It's clear that when the uprisings first began in Tunisia and then we saw the huge demonstrations in the middle of Cairo in Egypt, yeah. it's clear that some Western leaders uh, were naive. They thought that perhaps this would be easy, that they could just withdraw support from dictators uh, who they had slightly lost patience with and that you wouldn't have to make a painful choice between stability through authoritarian rule on one hand, which they had tried and which had not worked out fantastically for those countries, and the other choice, people said, would immediately be extremely radical Islam. Mm -hmm. Instead, you saw, because they had these sort of secular, uh, young, sort of, in some cases, you know, sort of pro-democracy urban people in places like Tahir Square, you saw Western leaders, uh, President Obama, David Cameron of Britain, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy of France saying, look at these people, they're not dangerous Islamists and they're not authoritarians, there's a middle way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be hard. We don't have to make the false choice of the past between stability on the one hand and radical Islam. Mm -hmm. it's, it's clear that that now looks naive because the big disaster was that the only sort of organized opposition force in a lot of those countries that was ready to go that was ready to take the sort of place in the vacuum left by the dictators was the Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. and most spectacularly in Egypt the Muslim Brotherhood completely messed up their chance of power so that kind of political Islamism that the Muslim Brotherhood represented that's not Al-Qaeda but was clearly devout but political Islamism they messed up their chance and they governed so badly that you saw the backlash and then, and then the counter-revolution. Mm -hmm. But the, the Muslim Brotherhood after the Egyptian army um, uh, carried out a coup d'etat against the Mohammed Morsi, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood and the president of Egypt. Uh, the Western forces uh, remained silent about it, almost silent. They didn't do anything about it. Can we say that, uh, and, and some people say that movement by the Egyptian army has fueled uh, radical Islam, and I mentioned in the set piece there have been a lot of, um, there's been um, a dramatic resurgence of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Syria and, and elsewhere. I think we're clearly back at that is painful there a connection. Th that clearly is, but I think we need to be careful about assuming that it's in the gift of Western leaders to decide what happens in these countries. I mean, you know, there is a debate in Washington where we are, you know, conservatives will sometimes attack President Obama for sort of who was the man who lost Egypt. You know, why did we sort of either give up on President Mubarak or why did we side with the Muslim Brotherhood when it was clearly going to lead to radical Islam? Mm -hmm. I think that that over imagines, you know, the ability to which Western leaders can control 
what happens in these countries. And my own magazine, The Economist, we did a big uh, report in the summer about the Arab Spring when it was already looking painful. One of the points made by our Cairo bureau chief uh, was, in some ways, it's a mistake to think of what happened as a revolution. It was an awakening. It was an awakening in people's minds. And, you know, we had had decades of authoritarian rule which had left these countries desperately impoverished. Mm -hmm. You had these very large young populations, uh, unusually young in global terms, who felt they had no economic future mm -hmm. and that all of the wealth in the country was directed to a small elite around the army and it wasn't sustainable. And that kind of rage exploded. And at that point, I think people who say, you know, the West at that point made a big mistake, they have to explain what would they want to see America do? What would they want to see the West do? Should we have sided with President Mubarak and said, send in the tanks, you know, use as much force as is needed to crush this spontaneous awakening? Because there was a spontaneous awakening. But I don't disagree with you for a minute that that early optimism that this would not be a choice between radical Islam and dictatorship, that early optimism now looks painfully naive. It's looking a lot harder now. And then do you agree that uh, uh, with with the, what I said, the Arab Spring seems to be over. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it's completely over because we still see uprisings happening in some of the countries. For example, Bahrain is one example, and Syria is another example. That we don't know the outcome of uh, these revolutions in those countries. That how these things play out and uh, how the future will hold for those countries. Yeah. But I do agree with both of you that when the Arab Spring first started, it 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 did start by uh, ordinary citizens uh, who wanted better economic opportunities, who were tired of dictatorship, and wanted to take charge of their own affairs. Uh, but as just uh, time went by, uh, unfortunately, uh, we saw that more radical groups, they, they fill, 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 uh, filled the gap, which was uh, vacated by, more, uh, by the uh, erosion of the state institution and control of the border. Uh, so we see that, uh, as you but say, in, that things in, are just... In, in Tunisia and, and, and Egypt, it wasn't the Salafist groups. It wasn't the radical groups who won the elections. It was like the kind of uh, moderate groups that won the elections. But they were still not uh, uh, given the chance to, to rule, right? But even, even the example the of Egypt, even the example of Egypt, uh, as, as David mentioned, that these countries had been under dictatorship for decades. So do these dictators had stifled uh, the civil society, the, the political parties. So these institutions, which are uh, a prerequisite for any democratic system, did not exist at that time. And the only, in Egypt, the only political party which was organized and existed was the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's why it won the election, not because the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was the most uh, popular uh, group in the country. And as Muslim Brotherhood just took charge of the affairs there, mm -hmm. then we saw that it, it, it just went from democracy to more major, majoritarianism. As mm -hmm. President Morsi was saying that I've gotten the votes so I can uh, do whatever I want and I'm not to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And he did not uh, try to just make the government inclusive. So he made the same mistakes that, for example, his predecessor had made. And we saw that again, uh, the uh, people just rose against mm -hmm. him. And of course, the army then uh, uh, took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. David, I would like to understand what uh, the policy of the Obama administration is vis-a-vis uh, -vis all of these developments in the Arab world, and uh, if you talk about Syria specifically. Well, I think to understand where we are now, you, you cannot get away from the fact that this is a post-Iraq uh, America, and this is a post-Iraq American political debate. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think you could see that even going back to the Arab Spring, I think it's tremendously important to realize, you know, where Western leaders were coming from. So at the time of the Arab Spring breaking out, uh, I was working as the British political editor of The Economist, and I flew in on David Cameron's airplane into Cairo, uh, I think three days after the uprising started. He was the first Western leader into Cairo. Um, and I remember him saying there, he met these kind of students and civil society groups, and there was a, they were looking for an opposition that was not only the Muslim Brotherhood. And he said this stuff about, we want to avoid the false choice of the past, that we imagine that you can naively drop Western democracy from 36,000 feet, like a sort of bomb. Or, you know, the old cynical idea that Arabs and Muslims cannot cope with democracy, and so you have to line yourself up with the military hard men. Now, when he's talked about we don't want to drop democracy from 36,000 feet. Everyone understood that what he was talking about mm -hmm. was George W. Bush and Tony Blair. So he was saying, in the British context, I am not Tony Blair. And President Obama came to office, essentially in terms of foreign policy, saying, I will be the un-Bush. 
I will remove troops from Iraq. I will, in fullness of time, remove troops from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that colors everything about his foreign policy. He, he came to office to end wars, not to start new wars. Now, in Syria, you know, when you go and talk uh, to the on, on, on that uh, yeah. thing that uh, David Cameron told, told all of you on, yeah. the, on the plane, but do you think that's exactly what they have been doing the for Western no, leaders vis-a-vis -vis the developments in, in, the, in the Arab world? One could say, like David, uh, that the Western countries um, are supportive of the developments in countries where it might be in their interest. For example, in Bahrain and Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, mm -hmm. they have you're, said you're, nothing you're, about that. You're, you're, the, the absolute, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the problem was that what he was saying was, I am not a neoconservative mm -hmm. who thinks you can bring sort of instant sort of Jeffersonian democracy to the, to the Arab world. Mm -hmm. But I'm not also, you know, all of my predecessors who mm -hmm. sucked up to Arab dictators. So, mm -hmm. and he kept using this phrase about it's a false choice. But the problem with that is you don't get to decide as a Western leader whether something is a false choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you will have to choose. And the problem is, as we've seen, as you say, the Muslim Brotherhood completely misinterpreted their electoral mandate and thought they had a mandate to do all of the Islamic things they wanted to do. And the tragedy is that, you know, that kind of low ambition neocon sort of vision they had was, you know, they, they thought they'd found a third way. Mm -hmm. Their vision for Egypt, their vision for Syria, their vision for Libya before, the, up, before, before the, the, the end of the war there was, you know, we won't have immediate perfect Western democracy, but these governments need to become more accountable. So David Cameron gave a speech in Kuwait during that tour where he said to the Kuwaiti government, you know, we want to see more power for the Kuwaiti parliament. We want to see something closer to democracy, more civil society, the building blocks of an accountable government. And that was essentially a bet on events that that kind of low ambition, not completely perfect democracy yeah. would keep the pressure sort of <coughs> eased and, and, and would make it all work. The problem is, that, as you say, in, in countries like Egypt, they completely misunderstood what their electoral mandate was yeah. and they profoundly blew it. And, and finally, on, in terms of the pressures on President Obama here, when it comes to things like Syria, I think what's very striking and very tragic is the single biggest political fact in American debate now is that the American public doesn't care. You know, we now have 11,000 children dead in Syria this year, mm -hmm. is the latest figure. American public opinion does not care because they essentially have decided that that's what Muslims do. Mm -hmm. Muslims kill other Muslims. Mm -hmm. That's what these people are like. And we can't do anything And we're not going to do anything about it. And it mm -hmm. doesn't help when America intervenes. And so Obama is under no let pressure me, to intervene at all. Let me bring in Ahmed. Uh, can, can I comment, uh, comment something very uh, briefly about uh, just the war weariness mm -hmm. here in America? Uh, that's true after Iraq and uh, Afghanistan especially, that people are just tired of war. People don't want uh, any uh, foreign intervention anymore. And Syria is a very just good example of that. But I would partly still blame the Obama administration for not explaining to the American people, not just about the children uh, that who are being killed on a daily basis in Syria, but also that how these emerging threats uh, from these uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated groups in Syria could pose uh, uh, dangerous threats to the uh, US national security in the mm -hmm. long term. We know that right now uh, the two most powerful and effective fighting force in Syria. There are uh, two affiliates of Al-Qaeda, the Al-Nusra Front and also the Iraqi branch of Al-Qaeda. And as they are consolidating their just uh, power and authority in different regions, uh, right now they are just focused on Syria. But once they establish their rule, of mm -hmm. course, they will become uh, a threat to the United States. So are States you saying well. that the Obama administration should, sh should shift its focus from demanding the Assad regime to go to attack the extremist rebels in Syria. I think that the Obama administration has very little That's leverage exactly in Syria. That's exactly what the Assad government wants him to do, basically. Well, the uh, Obama administration has very little leverage uh, right now in Syria. And, and in these kind of, e even in foreign intervention, momentum matters, as we saw in Libya. Uh, but now the Assad regime has uh, almost just won the war. And the rebel groups, uh, uh, although they have local authorities, but they are not a coherent opposition force. Uh, just fighting against the Assad regime, and the Assad regime maintains regional uh, support from Hezbollah, from uh, Iran, and also from far, far away countries like Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does have a very good ch ch uh, chance of just sustaining itself. And the United States doesn't have any leverage with the Syrian regime, nor does it have any uh, leverage with uh, most of the rebel groups who are fighting in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you the, the question that I asked in the introduction. Do you think the militant, um, rab radical militant Islamist groups such as Al-Qaeda are resurgent again as the Arab Spring hopes are kind of fading. And um, 
look, look, I mean, if you just look at Syria and Iraq, mm -hmm. on, like this Monday, a Sunni radical group, an affiliate of Al-Qaeda, was able to kill 70 Shia, 70 Iraqis in one day, mm -hmm. uh, mostly Shia pilgrims. That's certainly, uh, that, that degree of violence is comparable to the worst days of the Iraq, uh, of the war, sectarian war in 2006 and 2005. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see that things are not going well at all on the ground. We need to make a distinction between Al-Qaeda-affiliated radical Islamists and then there are some other sort of Salafist uh, fronts which some Western diplomats will tell you, you know, they, you know, even if you've given up on essentially the secular opposition, uh, if you've given up on the, you know, the, 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 the Syrian National Army uh, of uh, General Idris, which uh, was, you know, the original hopes were the, that they could be sent arms and equipment or, or at least non-lethal aid. But, you know, there are some groups out there which are not Al-Qaeda, but which are clearly Salafist uh, and, and very devout. Some people are talking about talking to them. I think fundamentally the, sort of the problem with the analysis within the Obama administration, and here I agree with you, is it was incoherent because they took the big dramatic step up front, which was to say Assad must go. Must go, yeah, two years ago. So that was already, you know, a huge kind of bet on, yeah. on, on events, putting their thumb on the scales. But then they actually had no desire to make that happen, mm -hmm. to bring that about. And I think that if you talk to people uh, inside the White House, if you go to the National Security Council and you talk to people there, one of the problems is internally they have been saying for more than a year and a half, this is a military stalemate. We do not believe that President Assad is capable of controlling his entire territory again. But we do not believe that the rebels are capable of overthrowing President Assad. So this will have to end with a negotiation. This will be a civil war which ends with a kind of a settlement. Mm -hmm. And the only role of the United States and the outside powers is to try to change the calculation, the cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. of the Assad regime and make them realize that they need to come to the table, that there will not be a military final victory to this. The problem is that they then haven't really sort of followed that up in their behavior because you had people saying, including... And recent, recently, they even suspended the aid to the, to the uh, moderate to rebels. To the moderate rebels, yeah, because, 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 because they'd lost all the warehouses to much more extreme people <coughs> who'd come and taken some of their supplies. One of the tragedies in this town, I don't know if you hear this, is as things get worse, that comforts both camps mm -hmm. that they're completely right. So the people who said, don't send too much aid, there isn't a good opposition, mm -hmm. this is a total mess. As things have got worse, they go, you see, we told you so. There is no good opposition. We should never have sent anything. The people, including The Economist magazine, who mm. thought that we should have sent more aid, we should have had no fly zones, there should have been much more support for the moderate rebels like General Idris. As things get worse, we say the exact opposite. We say, you see, we told you so. Things are getting worse. You should have sent more aid earlier. And so both camps are completely dug in. The worse things get in Syria, now the more dug in both camps mm. are getting. Now people like you in The Economist magazine or like at the AEI, do you think you are, um, uh, and, and like say the Obama administration, the gap is getting narrower and both of you agree that there shouldn't be any, um, the, the flow of aid shouldn't increase? Well, uh, I'll not speak on behalf of the American Enterprise Institute because we are, we are different scholars and each of us have different opinions on uh, each, each, each case. Uh, but my personal opinion about uh, just the US policy in Syria is, and I agree with David, that two years ago President Obama uh, said that Assad must go, but he didn't have any strategy to just follow that up. Uh, like his uh, actions did not match his rhetoric at all. And then um, one and a half year ago, he said that uh, the use of chemical weapons is just a red line. And it was the 13th or 14th time that the chemical weapons was used that uh, President Obama just started to take action. So many, many of uh, those uh, rebel groups also d does not take the United States very seriously at this time. And, 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 and those groups, they do not have, uh, they do not want any just link with the United States as, at all. And those kind of like pro-Western, or even if they were not pro-Western, but the West could work with uh, the genuine op opposition groups, uh, they are losing territory just mm -hmm. on, a, on a daily basis. And as just but David mentioned. Yeah. In May 2013, like a uh, few months ago, President Obama here at uh, the National Defense University yes. declared that Al-Qaeda was on the path to defeat. That, was, that are his own words. Was that a misjudgment on his behalf? That was just a political statement. He knows himself that Al-Qaeda is not a path, uh, on the path to defeat. 
uh, Al Qaeda core has been weakened uh, uh, in Pakistan because of the drone strategy and because of the military presence of the United States in Afghanistan over the past 12 years. But Al Qaeda has changed over the past decade. Mm -hmm. It has become more decentralized and it has metastasized uh, all over from Pakistan all the way to Morocco. Mm -hmm. And, and it, we are just talking about Syria, but Al Qaeda affiliates has presence Does in all the, these different countries. decentralization means weakness? No, it does not uh, mean weakness at all. It means that uh, these groups have more autonomy in their kind of uh, decision-making processes, but they still uh, are linked to Al-Qaeda, as we saw the, in the embassy closure episode, that al Zawahiri had asked the Yemeni branch, branch of Al-Qaeda uh, to, to do something. So, so Al-Qaeda has changed, but unfortunately, the United States' strategy to deal with terrorism has not changed. It, it is still the Obama administration is tre uh, treating uh, the uh, emerging uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates in, in the Middle East the same way that uh, uh, the Bush administration was treating the 2011. So Al-Qaeda has changed and it's now time for the United States to change its strategy too. Mm -hmm. And the strategy, I think it should be global in scope. Mm -hmm. But still, it should be country specific. What is really the Obama Obama so strategy, Obama's counterterrorism strategy? I mean, we all have heard, have seen a lot about the drone mm -hmm. campaign. That's the m basically the most visible part of his counterterrorism policy. Yeah, I, I, I must disagree that the Obama campaign, the, the, Obama, the Obama administration's counterterrorism policy is very much the same as George Bush's at the end of the Bush administration. I think there is a substantial difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, there's a substantial difference in terms of what they think the alternatives can be. There's a substantial difference in terms of who they are willing to work with. Uh, I think that, you know, although the Bush administration ended up more realistic and, and less kind of ambitious about democracy than, than it began, I think there was still an idea that you had to find people who were broadly in line with American and Western values to be your sort of force against al-Qaeda, your sort of bulwark. I think the Obama administration is much more willing to work with, you know, whoever looks most likely to keep the keep the threat limited and, as you say, to stop it sort of spreading like a cancer from, from place to place. Uh, and, you know, fundamentally, this is about domestic American politics. I mean, there are two counterterrorism policies. One is to stop another attack in America, and that is by far the most important task that they, that they have given themselves. The other is to try and stop the creation of new versions of, say, pre-2001 uh, Afghanistan where you have a, a failed state which is a safe haven for al-Qaeda. So, you know, those are the two tasks. But the level of ambition has lowered and their, ability, and their willingness to use fairly unsavory people to help them, I think, has, has increased. Uh, as far as drones are concerned, as you, you rightly say, that May speech was tremendously important because he set out a very big change in drone policy. Mm -hmm. He raised the standard for the use of drones, said that there had to be continuing and compelling immediate danger to the United States or its national sort of interests. And you had to be very confident that there were not going to be civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that, as he said himself this in his speech, uh, drones are very note, tempting I'll things to, to use. I'll have to take a, a short break, but after the break, I'll come back to you, Ahmed, to continue our discussion. Dear viewers, please stay with us. After this short break, we'll come back to dig deeper on this, the question of whether radical Islamism is resurgent in the Middle East. Hello again and welcome back to Inside America. Ahmed, before the break, uh, David was talking about President Obama's drone campaign and how the, we all hope to minimize civilian casualties in all of those drone strikes. I think you wanted to make a comment. Uh, yes, the, the problem is that the Obama administration, in my opinion, is uh, treating the drones campaign as a strategy, while the drone attacks are only a military tactic mm -hmm. that can be part of a strategy. Uh, as we see in Pakistan, it has had its effectiveness in uh, uh, not dismantling but degrading the Al-Qaeda and also the Pakistani Taliban's uh, leadership mm -hmm. as uh, the leader of the TTP or Tariq Taliban in Pakistan was recently killed. And it has killed many of the Al-Qaeda top lieutenants in, in Pakistan as well. But it has not eliminated the danger and Al-Qaeda has shown to be more resilient and adaptive. And on the political side also, uh, these drone attacks 
they create a lot of international controversies. If a lot of international organizations, they talk about the transparency issue, they talk about the legality of the drones attacks, so the, inter uh, the pressure is building. And at yeah. these countries at local level too, uh, right now Pakistan has already become the most anti-American uh, 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 country in the world, and that is partly just because okay. of the drones is attacks. Is it a successful military tactic? Okay. Well, it can be successful in kind of uh, dealing with certain groups and targeting their leadership, but it cannot be successful as a matter of just a strategy. Mm -hmm. And the problem, and, and, and one, one key problem is that David is right, that there is difference that, as President Obama and May mentioned, that there should be more transparency and it should be directed only to uh, groups which pose an imminent threat. But, uh, and also there should be more transparency and the legality issue. But six months after that speech, we don't see any change. We still, the, the program is very much non-transparent. We don't know how many attacks, for example, the Obama administration has not released, how many attacks have happened in Pakistan or Yemen. And even about the imminent threat, what about the recent uh, killings in, in, in Yemen, even the, uh, in the weddings? Uh, did that uh, pose any imminent threat to the United there States? Are, there so are that, certainly that a, lot a lot of questions, questions about the drone campaign. But can we shift a little bit? Can I just say one final thing on the, on the drones that I think which is very important is that one of the things that people were briefing in May was that one of the reasons to have a more formal legal policy around drones mm -hmm. is that we're not that far away from a time when other countries will have armed drones. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and you know, if America is claiming the right to use these drones wherever it likes, you know, one of the examples, uh, a man, John Berenger, who used to be a Siegel le senior legal officer for the Bush administration dealing with these issues, exactly these issues, he wrote a fascinating paper saying, you know, imagine Russia has an armed drone and there is a Chechen terrorist, in its view, who yeah. threatens Russian interests, who is currently in Georgia, and Russia decides it has the legal right to go and take him out in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And that would be using the same legal arguments that America was. So I think that was a very large explanation as to why President Obama tried to put it on a much narrower, more legal footing, because they're conscious that they're not going to be on their own as a, as a drone-using country for long. David, I'd like to shift from uh, uh, the drones to, 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 to Tunisia. In Tunisia, we recently had, um, uh, it was last week, I think, we, had, we saw um, uh, uh, some sort of unprecedented deal between the secular forces and the Islamists who are in power. And that was seen as a hope that we might eventually see a democratic government in Tunisia, the only democratic government. What do you think about that? Well, again, you know, we've discussed the naivety of Western leaders when the, the Arab Spring first broke out. But, you know, my magazine, The Economist, we have, we have said, you know, it's going very badly. We're facing some very tough choices, the Arab Spring in general. But it is only three years. Mm. And if you look at the, the dictatorship model, the kind of strongman model, the argument that oh, Arabs and Muslims cannot cope with democracy. Well, that model was given more than 40 years to prove that it was correct. Mm -hmm. 50 years, really. And it wasn't correct. I mean, if you look at Egypt's economy in 1960, it was the same GDP as South Korea. When Mubarak fell, Egypt had fallen to one-fifth, 20% of the GDP of South Korea. So you could see that where a country like South Korea had taken off, left authoritarian rule behind and become a major global economic power, Egypt, the largest, most important Arab country, had completely stagnated. Tunisia, a very similar story of economic stagnation. Remember, as you say, that's why the Arab Spring began, with the humiliation not of a student activist or not of a politician, but of someone who wanted to run a street stall to sell fruit and vegetables. It was a, a political but also an economic sense of intense frustration and the humiliation that they faced every day from kind of petty bureaucrats and, and officials. And mm -hmm. So that was decades of a failed experiment in authoritarian rule. So I think, though there are very tough choices, we is should be patient and we should be you know, watching very cautiously and very skeptically the kind of developments that happened in Tunisia last week. But we should also give it time. We shouldn't expect uh, perfection over time. And I think we should be very, very skeptical of arguments that somehow you can just cram all of that public anger back into a bottle and put the cork back in and go back to some sort of pre-Arab Spring authoritarian model. I think that would be a very dangerous misreading of the forces at work on the ground. Mm -hmm. After the uh, recent concession from uh, the Islamist leaders in Tunisia, and that was also, that also of, of course, came after the coup d'etat in, in Egypt, people could say in the Middle East that democracy is not applicable to Islamists. When the Islamists come to power, we won't accept it. Western powers will not accept it. Even the people in those countries will not accept it. 
Well, uh, I, I, I wouldn't just say that uh, just the West will not accept it, but uh, just democracy is not just about elections. It's, it is much more about the elections. And in the case of Egypt, we saw that even Muslim Brotherhood came into power uh, through democratic means, but then the policies that they were pursuing, they were not democratic and inclusive. Uh, so uh, the West also should treat just uh, these uh, the democracy process in these countries just much more than elections. Mm -hmm. And the problem with, uh, with, with Egypt, for example, was that when President Morsi uh, started these non-inclusive and more uh, dictator-like policies in, in, in Egypt, the Obama administration uh, and, and many indeed European uh, countries also did not in, uh, raise any voices. So that's a lesson to be learned. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be very careful, and I know that that's not what either of you are saying, but some of the voices saying, you know, Islam is not compatible with democracy. It is, is it it's essentially racism. It's essentially but racism. It's it, saying it, that it, Muslims it, it, are not capable of governing themselves. They're not capable of accountable government. They're not capable of government that actually has so a mandate from the people. Now, look at Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Look at Indonesia. Those are both Muslim countries with elements of Islamism uh, in their political structures, and it may not be absolutely perfect kind of Swedish democracy, but it's a lot better than the dictatorships uh, well. that ran before Turkey as well. I mean, Turkey has had, you know, large street demonstrations suppressed with some violence, but it looks for the moment, and I, I don't want to sound naive, it looks more like Brazil in terms of the level of demonstrations and the response. So it's not great, but it looks more like Brazil than it does like, I mean, certainly than Syria. So it's, it's, it's unbelievably sort of pessimistic, I think, to say that Islam is incompatible with accountable uh, government and civic structures. And those millions Ahmed. of demonstrators in Egypt, they were Muslims too, and I personally know uh, many people who participated against, first against uh, uh, the a dictatorship and uh, later against Morsi. And they're very devout Muslims. Uh, they want democracy, and, and they're at the same time, they're very devout Muslims. So I agree with mm. David that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this, uh, I, was, I was asking about not Islam or Muslims in particular, I was asking about the Islam, is political Islam. Political Islam is basically, like that's what it seems, is not allowed to rule it's in it any of those countries. Either the opposition uh, would not accept it, mm -hmm. or there is little Western support. And you're right that political Islam uh, has a very bad record. You are also absolutely right that if you go to the streets of, uh, around the time of the counter-revolution, the Muslim Brotherhood had posters of Barack Obama saying that he was on the side of General Sisi and the, and the military and that he was trying to destroy the Muslim Brotherhood. Ironically, you also had pro-army posters saying that uh, Barack Obama was in league with Al-Qaeda and was a Muslim who was trying to destroy military rule. So, but I think you know, the problem with the Muslim Brotherhood, the problem with all of these political Islam groups is because they existed in the shadows mm -hmm. for so many decades under military dictatorship and they had these cell structures and they were essentially kind of underground groups, that gave them this very sort of disciplined but also paranoid sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. They didn't think into And I think that was the tragedy of the Muslim Brotherhood was it, was it wasn't the best form of political Islam you could imagine, but it was the only one that, e that existed at the time. But it's it had born out of that sort of underground cell by cell sort of uh, sort of resistance type structure and mm. so they just were not ready for as you say they, they, they totally misinterpreted their, their electoral mandate their very narrow win you know they just squeaked over 50 percent and they thought now we've been given a mandate by the Egyptian public to ram through everything we've always wanted to do right. sort of immediately and that wasn't at all the mandate that they had right. they had a mandate to not be Hosni Mubarak okay. and to be less corrupt. O over the past few years we've even just seen um, dramatic change in the, domestically within the Arab world countries. But also we've seen uh, some sort of change in the international relations of, of those countries. For example, Saudi Arabia uh, is now very um, frustrated with the way the United States deals with Syria and Iran. And we just saw an uh, opinion piece in the New York Times by the ambassador of Saudi Arabia uh, criticizing the United States for its uh, detente with Iran and also for its inaction against Syria. Are we expecting any kind of big change in Saudi-U.S. relations? Uh, it's early to tell because uh, still there are a lot of uh, shared interests uh, between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Mm. And, and Saudi Arabia, uh, although has uh, uh, tried to get closer to uh, other world powers like Russia and China, but it understands that they cannot uh, replace the United States as its protector somehow. Yeah. But, but, but you're right. At first, it happened during the Arab Spring because the United States and Saudi Arabia, they had very divergent uh, interests and policies. 
uh, when it came to Egypt, when it came to Bahrain, when it came to many other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the recent uh, deal, a nuclear deal between the United States and Iran, that has also worried uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel and some other Gulf uh, countries as well, because they were not part of those secret meetings which happened before the interim deal. So they did, it did not have the consent of these countries uh, as did happen. We know that these Gulf countries, they have given up their enrichment right. And, and the fear f by them and the perception by them is that if Iran has the enrichment right now, so that uh, they, they will follow, follow suit and they, they, sh they should uh, go for their own nuclear program, which can create a cascade of proliferation in the region. So you see a, lo a lot of deepening uh, distrust between the um, Gulf nations and no, the United distrust. States. I need to take another short break, but after the break, we will come back to have your take on the subject, Dave. Uh, dear viewers, please stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Hello again, and welcome back to Inside America. Uh, Dave, uh, he was talking about how sectarianism is <coughs> increasing in, in the Middle East or in parts of the Middle East at least. Uh, but uh, I would like to also ask you a question about um, the, the recent detente between Iran and the United States. You can definitely comment on the subject mm -hmm. that you wanted to comment about, but I would like to understand what kind of impact it might have on the conflict in Syria where sectarianism is really at maybe the highest level mm -hmm. ever since the mm -hmm. establishment of the country. Well, I think we need to explain to uh, your viewers mm. that w perhaps they would be astonished to know how many American voters and even American members of Congress, they have a very hazy idea of the difference between Sunni and Shia Islam mm -hmm. and a very hazy idea of how important that conflict, all of those sectarian conflicts are. So in American political discussion of Syria and in American political discussion of even the Iran deal, the, 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 the measure people use tends to be these Muslims, are they extremist or are they not extremist? And so you see uh, Republican politicians saying, you know, America should not help the rebels in uh, Syria because we shouldn't be Al-Qaeda's air force. Mm -hmm. No discussion at all of what's going on in terms of the sectarian side of that. And when, when you mentioned the, the Saudi anger, the tremendous sort of displays of Saudi frustration, Saudi concern about American detente with Iran, that is clearly understood by people, your viewers, as intimately linked with the sectarian distrust between Sunni and Shia, that Iran is heading to the world, you know, a Shia nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And that's what that means. And, and I think that if you, again... If is you that the main concern for Saudi Arabia as an expert on, on the Middle East? Can you I, I can't mind read the Saudi Arabians. What I can tell you is that as a journalist based in Washington, when I have spoken to people in the National Security Council in the White House about this, one of their concerns, off the record, which they will not say in public, is that there are Gulf Arab monarchies who somehow dream, at least part of their governments, their intelligence machines, dream of a kind of once and for all bloodletting that will reorganize the Middle East around Sunni Shia lines, that this is a chance to have a kind of clear out, certainly in Syria, of the, uh, you know, that the Assad regime, because it's linked to the minority Alawite sect, that that is you know, a Shia affiliated sect that somehow if you could pour enough resources into the, into the Sunni uh, rebels and the Sunni opposition fighters, you could have a kind of bloodletting to end all bloodletting, that the whole of the Arab Spring and certainly in Syria is a chance to shake it all up and have a kind of reckoning and to sort the Shia out once and for all. And there are people inside the American machine who are very concerned that that is the intention of at least some people in the Gulf and that they are very concerned that America should not in assist Gulf Sunni regimes in a kind of genocidal bloodletting, a sort of sectarian civil war. And I think President Obama has even said in public, you know, those who want to turn this into a sectarian civil war that could set the whole region on fire, America is not going to take part in that. And so the fact that America, as you say... But Saudi Arabia did threaten to pursue an independent foreign policy in Syria, regardless of what the policy of the Western powers. And then that's another, uh, that's a wider discussion because you know, Saudi Arabia has also, in, you know, in recent times, has signed uh, the largest arms deal in history to buy another uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars worth of American armaments. The entire of the Saudi security apparatus, which keeps Saudi princes you know, <laughs> safe from the extremists in their own country who would dearly love to rise up and slit all of their throats. Mm -hmm. That entire military security apparatus is at the moment American. American weaponry, American arms, American advisors and American intelligence. So you have to assume that 
the Saudis can be very, very frustrated with the Americans. Mm -hmm. But unless things change extremely dramatically, I'd like to have they're not going to turn against America. take on, on that point that you made. There's, uh, uh, he said there's, um, I mean, from the uh, officials in Washington who talk off the, the, the record, they kind of say there's a perception in the Middle East and the Sunni countries that they want to basically ethnically or sectarianly cleanse the Shias in, in those countries. And this detente is definitely uh, between Iran and the United States going to make that more difficult to happen. Yes, we already see indications of that. Of course, mm -hmm. that the sectarian war started uh, mostly just in Syria, but uh, that's not confined to the Syrian borders anymore. Uh, we already see that uh, the uh, sectarian war has expanded into Lebanon uh, because the Syrian war started or is right now is being fought by a Shiite axis of Iran, Hezbollah, and the Alawite Hasid regime uh, against uh, rebel groups uh, which are supported by uh, all uh, Sunni governments in the region. And, and that the same, uh, the same scenario is now being played in Lebanon because now because of Hezbollah's engagement, uh, direct engagement in, in Syria, now that has radicalized the Sunni community, which already uh, feels very isolated from the political establishment, which is dominated by Hezbollah. And also their uh, leaders, like Saad Ariri, was killed, assassinated in 2005. Their intelligence minister was killed last October, uh, so uh, October 2012. So they feel that the only way now is uh, to just uh, uh, fight through terrorism. Mm -hmm. And these moderate Sunni leaders also, they have lost grip of the Sunni communities. Now very radical groups, which are, some of which are uh, closely allied with al-Nusra Front in Syria or with other al-Qaeda franchise, they are uh, uh, conducting uh, terrorist attacks against Hezbollah uh, groups. And some Hezbollah groups have also have conducted that. Neither group uh -huh. wants this in Syria, the Sunnis, Shias, and others. But it's just going out of their uh, uh, and and see, since you are talking yeah. about the Syrian conflict, I'd like to bring in the Kurdish role in that conflict as well. We've uh, seen um, uh, a lot of clashes between the uh, uh, the, fo the PYD forces. PYD is the strongest militant Kurdish group in Syria, and Al Qaeda forces. Mm. Uh, but uh, the Western powers and the United States, they they they, they have not. Uh, they've kind of uh, been on the sidelines of this. They've, of course, they never support Al Qaeda and its uh, affiliates, but they haven't even uh, they haven't supported the Kurdish group either. What do you make of that? The Kurdish citizens of Syria, unfortunately, they are just under threat for, uh, from both sides, both by the Syrian regime mm -hmm. uh, and also by the uh, radical, uh, just uh, Sunni groups or Salafist groups mm -hmm. in the region. And, wha and, and you're very right that the United States and even uh, regional countries, they have not paid in, uh, enough attention to that. And si similarly, you can also argue for the Christians uh, in Syria, which are just being slaughtered just by both sides. And, and as the conflict just grows, and as the Salafist groups just establishes their rule, the danger to them uh, grows even more. I, I think I have to disagree that they're not paying attention. And I think I have to disagree with, you know, you hear on the ground a lot of people on the two sides saying, you know, America and the West should be on our side because look at the atrocities on the other side, you know, or, or accusing America of being on the side of the Shia because of what they're doing in Iran, or accusing the Americans of being on the side of the Sunni because of their historic security relationships with the Gulf monarchies. I think the truth is different. The truth is that this government in America doesn't want to choose at all. They don't want the Sunnis to, to win sides. completely and they don't want the Shia to win completely. They want both sides to remain are going to have to share this you territory. Are you saying that the status quo is in the interest of the United States? The Not the status quo, but I mean, you hear people describing Syria, and, and you know a great deal more about this, you know, the strikes on the ground. The problem with Syria can be reduced to 70% of the population, the Sunnis, have 30% of the military firepower. 30% of the population have 70% of the firepower. Yeah, they're the same and, right. and, and that's a stalemate. And it will end, in the view of many people in this town, it will have to end with people sharing that space. There will have to be, you know, you cannot have every Alawite slaughtered and run into the sea. Sure. And if that is the outcome that faces the Assad regime, he has precisely no incentive to give any concessions at all because it becomes a sort of a defense of his own clan against a genocidal bloodletting. And there are people around him who presumably do think that, that that's what they face. Mm -hmm. So from America's perspective, it gets accused of being on one side or the other. Or it gets accused of not paying attention to one group or another. Is the United Christians. States going it's not that. Is America the United doesn't States doesn't want to have to take sides. Is the United States going to pay attention to Saudi Arabia's demands? 
I think it's very hard for the United States to control what the Saudis do. I mean, there, there are great suspicions that, you know, the Gulf Arab monarchies are as ever playing both sides of the extremism card, that they hedge their bets by arming extremists who probably hate them. Uh, but it's hard. I remember there was a very brilliant uh, British diplomat who once said, the problem with foreign policy is that it involves foreigners, and they don't always do what you tell them. That's brilliant. And I think you yeah. know, that, that's a <laughs> work here. Yeah. So well, I agree, I agree that uh, just, uh, uh, the US has limited influence to sh just shape the Syrian conflict now. Uh, and also doesn't uh, want to uh, just take sides, although I think that the uh, United States has taken sides with the rebels, but the problem is that now rebels is not a unified group and the Salafis has taken over in parts of the country. So that's why it, it has, so that's, that's also the cost of uh, disengagement because uh, of course people here are just tired of war, uh, tired of any kind of sending boots on the ground especially. But, uh, but to believe that kind of like disengaging from the region will not have any uh, problem for the United States, that's al also I so think is inaction is, riskier is than action. Well, well, th th that's the same case in Syria, for example, because the U.S. doesn't have much control over these Islamist groups, which are uh, gaining ground, and some of them are uh, supported by this uh, Saudi government. And to just subordinating all the all the policies to regional governments, they will pursue their own interests, and most often those those uh, their interests will not be in line with the United States. Mm -hmm. So, what are are we going to see as the uh, the, the hopes are really diminishing about the prospect of a, demo a long-lasting democracy in any of those countries where we've seen uh, popular prizings, uh, with the exception of Tunisia. And uh, we were seeing uh, the resurgence of Al-Qaeda and its affiliates in Iraq, in Syria. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we're seeing uh, United States getting closer towards Iran, Saudi Arabia getting more worried. So what's going to happen next? Well, sitting in Washington, if you're trying to look at things, you know, we've discussed the limited ability of America uh, to influence events uh, on the ground. America can influence one big thing, which is the negotiations with Iran. So if you're looking at the next few months and you're trying to work out where are the moving pieces, where are the moving parts of this, uh, where America and the other Western countries do have considerable clout, it is clearly now we have this six-month uh, time frame for Iran to demonstrate that it is uh, shown compliance with this deal. It's not a perfect deal by any means. Uh, and, and it's important that the six-month time frame hasn't actually started yet. The clock hasn't been sort of set in motion. But this is the one sort of moving piece that President Obama controls absolutely. You know, he can decide uh, whether he chooses to uh, trust this process and to let this process run its course, uh, backed by the Europeans. You can see tensions already. Will this process be allowed to take place? One of the parts in Washington is whether Congress decides that it doesn't trust Iran, but it doesn't trust President Obama either. And so will Congress try and disrupt this process by sort of putting in sanctions that wreck they the whole deal? So that's the moving part that we can, we can watch and have some effect on. We will have to leave it there, and I think we will see in the future whether the, uh, this detente will turn to a comprehensive deal between the United States and Iran, and what kind of implications that might have on the broader Middle East. But thank you so much, David Rennie, the uh, Washington uh, Bureau Chief for The Economist magazine. Thank you so much for talking to Rudao. Ahmed Majidiar, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you so much for talking to us as well. Thanks for Dear viewers, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, be well.